Incoming transmission. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to True Spies. Week by week, mission by mission, you'll hear the true stories behind the world's greatest espionage operations. You'll meet the people who navigate this secret world. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? This is True Spies. Here was a guy who had tried to sell loads of classified American secrets to hostile nations and had almost gotten away with it. He was smarter than others thought he was, but he wasn't as clever as he himself thought himself to be. This is True Spies. Episode 104, The Spy Who Couldn't Spell. A white middle-aged man is walking through Pocahontas State Park in Virginia with a bulging rucksack on his back. After a few miles, he stops, checks behind him, then steps off the marked path and heads deep into the forest. From his rucksack, he removes what looks like a full rubbish bag smothered in duct tape and a shovel. Whilst he digs, Brian imagines that the next time he visits this spot to retrieve his buried treasure, he'll be $13 million better off. This bag doesn't contain stolen jewels or even gold. It contains documents, hundreds of documents, segregated neatly into little Tupperware boxes. These containers are full of American state secrets. To finish, he hammers a nail into the tree closest to the fresh burial mound. Satisfied, he walks back in the direction of the path, leaving highly classified documents, documents which could leave the United States extremely vulnerable to its enemies, just lying there in the Virginian dirt. This is the story of how one man set out to commit an enormous act of betrayal against his country and almost got away with it. His name is Brian Regan. He's currently languishing in an American prison with no hope of parole and strictly prohibited from speaking to anyone in the outside world except his close family. So how do we know so much about his crimes? Hi, my name is Yudijit Bhattacharji. I'm a contributing writer at National Geographic and the author of The Spy Who Couldn't Spell, which is the story of the Brian Regan espionage case. Several years after Brian Regan was sentenced to a lifetime behind bars, Udijit was invited to speak with an FBI cryptanalyst called Daniel Olson. He had worked on breaking the codes of prison gangs, exchanging letters with one another and things like that. But right at the end of his presentation, he talked about an espionage case that he had done some code breaking for. And I was immediately hooked. And that case turned out to be the Brian Regan espionage case. And what really interested me about this case was, at the time, just the sheer sort of ingenuity of how this would-be spy had stolen and then hidden all of these classified secrets, I knew that I had a character that I would probably never have access to. I tried my best going through various government agencies to try and establish contact with Brian Regan. But since Brian Regan had committed an egregious crime, the terms of his incarceration were extremely strict and he wasn't allowed to contact anybody outside of his family. So it became clear to me that I would perhaps never have any access to him, no possibility of doing interviews with him. So how do you go about chronicling the crimes of an individual you can't communicate with? You track down the person who caught them, of course. Enter Stephen Carr. He knew everything about this case. He had given this case several years of his life, and I was fortunate 
in that Steve Carr and I developed a friendship as I sort of went along reporting the story. Uh, Steve Carr was really an extraordinarily kind and compassionate man. His idea of patriotism was being of service to the country. And that is what had drawn him to the military. That is what drew him into a career in law enforcement. And so he was really the antithesis of Brian Regan. Prior to leading the Brian Regan investigation, Steve Carr was pretty much a poster boy FBI agent. Patriotic with an immense sense of duty, meticulous, and praying for a chance to lead a high-stakes mission. Be careful what you wish for. It's December 2000, and FBI Special Agent Stephen Carr sits at his desk in Washington. He begins to open a FedEx parcel that's been mailed over from the New York office. He has no idea what's inside. Some 20 or 25 sheets had been mailed to the New York office by an anonymous sender and it contained a coded letter that was several pages long and it contained a code book and it contained instructions for how to use the code book to decode this letter. And what this letter said was that the sender was a veteran member of the intelligence community who had in his possession hundreds and thousands of pages of classified material that he was willing to sell for the right price. Willing to sell to the Libyan government for $13 million, to be exact. These envelopes had originally arrived at a Libyan embassy and been intercepted by a friendly source who recognized immediately the potency of what they contained. Each of these, the coded letter, a bundle of 19 classified documents, and two sets of code sheets designed to help someone decode the letter were sent in three separate envelopes. And so the person sending it was well-versed in what's known as COMSEC or communication security, that if any one of these three letters had been intercepted by itself, that one interception would not have posed any threat to the sender. The code sheets consisted of a list of ciphers, a method of transforming letters into numbers to conceal meaning, and a list of brevity codes, encoded abbreviations for words. For example, the letters KJ could stand for association, or YF could mean confirmed. So KJYF would translate to association confirmed. And the smoking gun? As Steve Carr rifled through the pages, he found a short extract of the letter, decoded by his colleagues in New York. I am willing to commit espionage against the United States by providing your country with highly classified information. I have top secret clearance and have access to documents of all of the U.S. intelligence agencies. There was something else very interesting about this letter which became a recurring theme in the case, many of the words that the sender had used in this typed letter were misspelled, uh, like, like the word disgraced or the word espionage. And so that was a clue that perhaps the sender was dyslexic and moreover, that the sender hadn't taken, uh, you know, due care while drafting this letter, basically had gone through all of this trouble to observe communication security, but hadn't run a basic spell check on the letter that he had sent. And so began the hunt for the spy that couldn't spell. The first American to face the death penalty for attempted espionage against his own country and the man investigators would come to know as Mr. 80%. And this analyst described it to me as, you know, here was a guy who'd be sort of 80% brilliant and then would do something all of a sudden, unexpectedly, that was incredibly stupid. Poor spelling or not, 
Steve Carr immediately recognised that they needed to locate Mr 80% and fast. One of the documents included in the original bundle was the Table of Contents from the Joint Tactical Exploitation of National Systems Manual, which was designed to aid a US warfighter in taking advantage of the enemy's satellites and other intel gathering technologies. And if the spy had access to this, who knew what other highly classified material they had managed to steal? This was just code red for Steve Carr and his colleagues in the counterintelligence unit because rarely do you come across such a blatant offer to sell secrets. There was no time to lose. The next thing they did was they started to do surveillance on libraries around the Washington, D.C. area because they had figured out that whoever had sent this letter was a prolific user of public libraries and was probably using the computer terminals at these libraries in order to do searches and sort of prepare the whole espionage plan. Finally, the breakthrough actually came from the contents of the letter itself because along with the letter, the sender had included a few classified sheets downloaded from Intellink, which is the intelligence community's intranet. And I think one or two of these sheets appeared with a part of the header and the footer printed out along with the rest of the material that had been downloaded. And from reconstructing that header and footer, these analysts and agents were able to figure out that these were pages that had been accessed at a particular time on a particular date. And then they started looking through the servers to see who might have accessed those particular pages from Intellink on that particular day. With this new information, they could narrow down their search considerably. Steve was able to instruct the National Security Agency to pinpoint which computers had been used to view that document on Interlink on that particular date. Two hits came from the NRO, the National Reconnaissance Office. Meanwhile, staff there had been identifying possible suspects from their own NRO personnel files. Working with a CIA psychiatrist, and based on Steve's interpretation of the coded letter, they believed they had zoned in on a suspect. Picture a high-stakes game of guess who, but this time the questions are not, are they wearing a hat? Do they wear glasses? It's more, are they nearing retirement age? Have they had previous financial issues? And, crucially, how is their spelling? They saw a lot of spelling mistakes in letters that this person had sent and that was another sort of bit of confirmation that they were most likely looking at the right person. They referred to this suspect, whom we now know to be Brian Regan, as Cast Lead. Along with his dyslexia, Cast Lead had also been a signals analyst, had some basic cryptology training and had recently retired but would still have been working at the National Reconnaissance Office on the date the document was accessed. Lo and behold, when they looked into the staff who had access to the two NRO computer suites in question, Cast Lead, a.k.a. Brian Regan, was the common denominator. But at this stage, in spring 2001, there is much that the investigators still do not know. Primarily, what exactly has been stolen? Where have the stolen documents been hidden? And which other hostile governments has Cast Lead attempted to auction off US secrets to? Fast forward to 2008, and by poring over the case files and interviews collected by Steve Carr and his colleagues, Udigit was able to map out Brian's activities from 1999 to the moment he was arrested in 2001. He printed out just tons and tons of classified secrets, and he was able to stack up these printouts, put them inside his gym bag at the end of the workday, 
and then just walk out every day with hundreds of printouts of top secret, sensitive, classified material. And nobody at the National Reconnaissance Office, nobody thought to stop him or check his bag even once. So that was surprising to me. There was another moment when Brian Regan had gone out of town on assignment. And uh, at the NRO, there was a crew that was coming around and collecting furniture, you know, chairs, tables, desks that were not really in use. And there was this cabinet that they took away. And when they opened it, there were these stacks of printouts stored inside the cabinet. And instead of talking to security, these guys simply returned these papers to Brian Regan. And Brian Regan continued to steal more and more classified materials. Since the autumn of 1999, having smuggled the classified papers and CD-ROMs home, Brian had sorted them into piles pertaining to each country. He stored them in Tupperware boxes in the basement of his house. He planned on burying these boxes in national parks, coding their coordinates so that only he could retrieve them when an enemy government, and for Brian it didn't really matter which, had paid him sufficiently for the contents. In the summer of 2000, when his family were out of town, Brian travelled to Pocahontas and Patapsco National Parks. Equipped with a shovel, he walked deep into the woodland and buried the packages he'd bundled in rubbish bags. He buried 19 bundles of documents in total. You'd think that the government would have better ways of protecting these secrets, but that wasn't the case. He'd been stealing these secrets for almost a year and had gone undetected. How? Well, one of Brian's secondary duties at the National Reconnaissance Office was maintaining the division's page on Interlink, the intelligence community's intranet, and so it wouldn't have seemed odd to anyone that he was spending so much time on there. Nobody suspected that he was downloading top-secret files and satellite intelligence on Iran, Iraq and Libya. To his colleagues, he was a most unlikely spy. Certainly, he lacked the forensic focus and attention to detail we've come to expect of our true spies. There were some other amazing moments in the story when Brian Regan decided that one particular package of material was simply too sensitive for him to go out and bury, and so he tried flushing it down the toilet at the motel where he was staying for a couple of nights when he was going out and burying these packages. And of course, that led to the toilet overflowing. Which led Udijit to question why such a man, with no formal training in tradecraft, was taking such a monumental risk. So Brian Regan saw himself as a victim. You know, he saw himself as somebody who never got credit for his intelligence and his contributions to society. So that became an operating theory about his inner life and his psychological characteristics. And then once I started to ask his colleagues, ex-colleagues, his friends from school, from childhood, to see if this was true, I started to discover anecdotes and discover facts about his life that totally supported this profile that I had built based on the case. Because of his severe dyslexia, Brian had been bullied and alienated as a child. Marked early on as stupid, Udidit determined that Brian had been underestimated all his life. As soon as he left school, Brian joined the Air Force where he learned about signals intelligence and analysis. Because of his dyslexia, which manifested as a learning disability because he wasn't such a good reader, he had to come up with other ways of storing information in his mind, other ways of analyzing information than what most people do. Brian was able to recognize visual patterns easily, had a brilliant photographic memory, and had exceptional spatial awareness, all things which helped him excel and land a job at the Pentagon, plotting Iraqi missile sites during the Gulf War of the early 90s. 
he'd become a respected figure amongst his colleagues and family. When he was moved to the National Reconnaissance Office in 1995, his colleagues were assigned more intellectually demanding, less practical tasks, and they looked down on him as a result. His sloppy appearance and poor people skills didn't help matters, and his colleagues often made fun of him. In some ways, Brian was back to being the bullied kid in the playground. Yes, he was, of course, insecure about his future and he wanted money, but he also wanted to prove to himself that he was smart. Because of this humiliation that he had suffered all his life, he felt that he wasn't respected enough. And so there was, in Brian Regan's mind, there was this feeling that he would show the world just how smart he was. Of course, he didn't intend to be caught, but he wanted to validate to himself his intelligence and his ability to outwit and outmaneuver the world. By the late 90s, Brian had four children at home and the family were in financial difficulty. They had racked up thousands of dollars of debt on more than 12 credit cards and things were beginning to spiral out of control. Faced with a posting to Europe, and unable to make that change, Brian had no choice but to take early retirement from the NRO, saying goodbye to a regular paycheck. He panicked. He needed a lot of money to pay his debts, and he needed it yesterday. So it really takes a lot of fantastical thinking and self-delusion and an enormous amount of chutzpah that's often not based in fact in order to commit this very, very grave crime of espionage. And I'd suspect that in Brian Regan's case, of course, his psychology and his feeling of being disrespected and humiliated and underestimated all his life played a huge role in driving him to commit this crime. But I also feel that his inability to connect with friends and have a social life was responsible because I don't think he had many reality checks. Now, I can imagine if Brian Regan had been talking to friends at the time and if he had expressed this anxiety to some of them, they would have said to him, oh no, almost everybody that is retired from your position has gotten a fairly comfortable job in the defense industry. There's always going to be a job for you. In fact, you know, why don't you talk to so-and-so? And if Brian had just had a few things like that happen during his moments of crisis, he would have made different choices and he wouldn't have brought such misery to himself and his family. But Brian Regan made the choices he made. By the time his letters to the Libyan embassy had been intercepted in late 2000, an FBI agent, Steve Carr, was alerted to the presence of a spy in one of the US agencies. Brian had squirreled away thousands of documents, but crucially, nobody was buying them. What would your next move be? Late in the spring of 2001, the FBI are in the dark about many of the intricacies of Brian's activities, but it's clear they need to catch him before he tries his luck again with any other enemy states. It turns out that surveillance isn't quite as simple as we imagine it to be, you know, from having watched movies and dramas on TV, because you still have to maintain a certain distance from the subject the FBI couldn't risk letting Brian Regan become aware that he was being surveilled. And so he was able to shake them off here and there. As you'll know by now, real clandestine work is often less about smash and grab and more about wait and see. And so they waited and watched and hoped that Mr. 80% stayed true to form. And so there were agents sort of posted close to his house, tailing him as he drove to work and so on. But 
early on in the investigation, there's this one moment when agents watch him go into a public library and the agents sort of follow him into the library and one of the agents is kind of pretending to read a newspaper. Another one is kind of pretending to read a book. As they're watching him, Brian Regan goes and sits down in front of a computer terminal and he does a bunch of searches. And then, of course, the agents can't get too close to see what he's looking at on the screen. And so they wait. And then Brian Regan finally sort of finishes up his internet session, gets up and walks out. And the agents go and, you know, they they grab that seat to see what he's been looking at. And lo and behold, (laughs) they find that Brian Regan hasn't closed his browser window. You know, that's like espionage 101, and he's failed to do that. So uh, the agents are simply able to recover his entire internet browsing history by clicking the back button, you know, back, 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 and they're able to reconstruct his whole search history. And it turns out he was searching for addresses of Iraqi and Libyan embassies in Europe at this public library terminal. So that helped to confirm that Brian Regan was actively sort of in the process of trying to sell information because clearly he was looking for these addresses because he intended to go there. Brian Regan did, in fact, succeed in leaving the country. You heard that right. A man who the FBI believed could be trying to sell classified information to hostile foreign states was able to leave the country whilst under surveillance. Unfortunately, the FBI kind of found out about him preparing to leave quite late, so they weren't able to adequately prepare to watch him the whole time. There are also some legal complications to doing surveillance as an American agency overseas. Fortunately, the FBI had some idea where he was going, because Brian had left a map of Switzerland behind on the subway. Unbelievably, he'd ripped out the section which encompassed the city of Bern and in effect left a trail of breadcrumbs for the Bureau. As it was later on discovered, Brian Regan did in fact visit the Libyan embassy in Bern, Switzerland. He in fact made contact with Libyan intelligence there But because he wasn't savvy about how to establish this relationship, he wasn't taken seriously by Libyan intelligence and they threw him out of the embassy. The fact that he had no knowledge of tradecraft, that he had no knowledge of how actual real spies operate, how they establish communications with another government, another intelligence service, He'd sort of keenly studied some espionage cases. In fact, that's what he was doing on Intel Link. Later on, agents discovered from going through the history of his searches, they saw that Brian Regan had actually been studying up on a number of espionage cases, including the Robert Hansen case, which was unfolding right when the FBI started to track Brian Regan. So that was perhaps a stroke of good luck for the FBI. Steve Carr, the special agent leading the FBI investigation, realizes that they need a new plan. He comes up with one, but it's bold, very bold. So by the summer of 2001, investigators knew for sure that Brian Regan was the traitor who had sent that offer to commit espionage to the Libyan consulate. And so they could have just swooped down and arrested him, but then they might not have been able to prove the case against him, and they really wanted to prosecute Brian Regan. And so they needed to collect more evidence. And at this point, Brian Regan had already retired from the NRO, but he was looking to return to the NRO as a contractor, and he was waiting for his security clearance to be reinstated so that he could join this company. So Steve drops in on the director of the National Reconnaissance Office, Keith Hall, and says, Look, 
We know that this guy has stolen tons of classified information from your agency and he has hidden it somewhere. We don't know where. And he's trying to sell it to Libya, to Iraq. So the only way to do that is to let him come back to the NRO because we are confident that he's going to try and steal more information. And that way we'll be able to catch him red-handed in the act of committing espionage. And so Keith Hall thought about this. Many of his advisors in the senior management of the NRO said, no way, you can't let a traitor back in to our building. I mean, that's a huge risk. We can't do that. But Keith Hall understood that without doing this, you know, without cooperating with the FBI, there was perhaps no way of really figuring out what Brian Regan had taken and undoing the damage that he had probably done. And so Keith Hall, much to Steve Carr's relief, agreed with this plan and said, you have a limited few months within which to conclude this case. And he approved reinstating Brian Regan's clearance. Brian Regan came back to work at the NRO and immediately started to download information that he wasn't supposed to download. Brian had been thrown a life vest. His debts were now threatening to drown him completely. And here was another chance to spirit away a cache of documents for an even bigger target. He set his sights on China. All Steve and his colleagues could do was sit and watch while this wannabe spy stole classified state secrets. The camera a size of a credit card chip sat innocuously above Brian Regan's desk, lodged in the ceiling plaster, watching him surf the interlink, clicking through decades' worth of Chinese military secrets in areas identified by the US as holding Chinese weapons of mass destruction. The FBI was watching him constantly monitoring his every keystroke at his workstation. You know, they could record his every move. So that's how they collected the last bits of evidence that they needed in order to arrest Brian Regan. The surveillance team watched him scribble down notes before attempting to destroy them in the department's burn bag. The notes were retrieved and related directly to the coordinates of the images Brian had perused. Within a couple of weeks, Regan put in a holiday request. He said that he was taking his family on vacation to Orlando. The FBI could see that he had in fact booked a flight for one to Frankfurt. No Mickey Mouse in sight. Steve Carr knew they had to detain him before he boarded the plane. On August the 23rd, 2001, the net finally closed in on Regan. Brian was simply too adamant to accept that he had no way out of being convicted and he always thought that he was smarter than the rest whereas you know the fact was that he wasn't quite as smart as he thought he was brian was convinced that he had done enough to cover his tracks and indeed at the time of his trial in spring 2003 the prosecutors still didn't know how exactly he'd smuggled the secrets out of the nro where he'd hidden them, and how many he had in his possession. They estimated around 8,000 documents, but Brian knew it was nearer to 20,000. Despite facing the death penalty, he refused to put in a guilty plea. Instead, Brian set about smuggling letters out of prison, instructing his wife, Annette, on ways to help strengthen his defense, and ultimately earning her a charge for perverting the course of justice. Even though his defense attorney wasn't able to help me in the end, she was able to confirm several of these characteristics and patterns of behavior that I had reported out. In spring 2003, just before the United States went to war with Iraq, another country Brian Regan had planned to sell secrets to, Brian was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. With his wife still facing criminal charges, Brian gave up the fight and agreed to help Steve put the final pieces of the puzzle together. Using his key, 
the NRO staff phone list which Regan had on him at the time of his arrest, Brian helped direct Steve to the first 12 packages. Steve and his team were shocked at the mistakes Brian had made. He was so careless that he left one of his posted notes with the name Brian Regan written on it. He let one of these posted notes stick to one of these garbage bags. And so if somebody had found it, then, you know, that, that, that would have been a clue as to, as to who the perpetrator of this crime was. Mr. 80% strikes again. Similarly, he had constructed this elaborate code to hide the coordinates of the locations where he had buried these parcels. But then he forgot the key to his own code. And so you can imagine if Brian Regan hadn't been caught, then there could have been a scenario where he was in contact with Libyan intelligence agents and maybe they had even paid him money and then he was sitting somewhere scratching his head thinking about how to break his own code. And this is where Dan Olson, the cryptanalyst that had first alerted Udijit to this story, comes in. When it came to the final seven packages, Brian couldn't remember how he'd used that particular key. This time, his junior yearbook. Dan was drafted in to help him crack it. They managed it, but some of the coordinates were off. Steve Carr knew there were still troves of top-secret documents out there for anyone to uncover. But his dogged sense of duty meant there was no let-up in the search. There was only one thing left to try. It was at some risk of losing his own reputation that Steve Carr was able to persuade his supervisors to talk to the highest levels of government, to let Brian Regan come out, escorted, of course, and in handcuffs to come out to this forest in Maryland and help the agents in locating the packages. So when that actually worked out, when the FBI was able to dig up the last few packages because of Brian Regan's tremendous visual memory, almost savant-like ability to remember where he had buried things, Steve Carr was extremely relieved. I had the good fortune of seeing a couple of videos that had been shot by the FBI during these uh, search operations with Brian Regan. I remember this one scene after a package was found uh, and Steve Carr sort of exults and turns to Brian and says, see, Brian, look what you did, uh, implying that, you know, look, you helped us find this last package. And Brian Regan leaning against a tree and just looking downcast And there was just so much uh, sadness in his face in that moment. So I have no doubt that while Steve Carr felt relieved that he had been able to dig up the last packages, he also felt uh, some sympathy for Brian Regan. I also felt sad for Brian Regan because I learned so much about his life and I realized that if things had gone slightly differently for him, You know, Brian Regan would be living a happy life today. He had no reason to be so anxious about his financial future and jeopardize his his life in the way that he did. That was a real bad judgment call on his part. And I felt that it was because he just probably just felt so alone. You'd be forgiven for thinking that bad judgment call is an understatement. The potential damage this information could have done in the wrong hands is hard to quantify. But you did it glean from Steve Carr that some of the documents could have caused an intelligence disaster on an unparalleled scale. Ultimately, had Brian Regan had a little more tradecraft in his arsenal, and if he'd been able to successfully make covert contact with enemy officials, there's a high chance he'd have been successful in his mission. He was smarter than others thought he was, but he wasn't as clever as he himself thought himself to be. Brian Regan will spend the rest of his life behind bars for attempted espionage against his own country. As for Udidit, 
this was my first book. I've written another book since. It taught me a lot about about humanity, about loyalty to one's country. Uh, it taught me a lot about investigative journalism. It taught me a lot about intelligence gathering because I felt like because I didn't have access to Brian Regan, I had to turn over every rock to find tidbits of information about him to finally sketch him out as a real person. But what of FBI Special Agent Steve Carr, who led this investigation and successfully retrieved all of the secrets which were stolen? In 2015, as I was kind of writing the last few chapters of the book, what really amazed me was Steve's sort of commitment to the story that even when he was in between chemotherapy sessions, um, you know, he was feeble, he had to be on oxygen, and yet he would always make time for me and try to answer my questions. What Steve went through in helping me is something that I'm never going to forget. I'll forever remain in his debt. It also showed me the character of Steve Carr, that he was so driven by a sense of purpose. Uh, he talked to me, answered my questions, you know, got on the phone several times a day simply because of the promise that he had made and he knew that I had quit my day job in order to write this book. So he knew what it meant to me personally. Steve Carr died in 2015 at the age of 53. He was diligent in his duty until the very end. To learn more about the intricacies of this case, be sure to read The Spy Who Couldn't Spell by Yudhidit Bhattacharji. I'm Vanessa Kirby. Here's a taste of next week's Ride Along with True Spies.